Hi, my name is Miles Ward. I'm global head of solutions for Google's cloud platform. I'm here to present today about media operating at cloud scale, delivering new transformative experiences in media development that are both, actually all three, faster, better, and cheaper. Uh, I'm gonna explain the offerings and changes that are happening in media, propose some new ideas maybe that you could apply uh, to some of your approaches and then show some examples about exactly how uh, cloud can deliver incredible value in media experiences. So I don't think there's any confusion or debate. Uh, there's this enormous transition happening in media. The movement from analog formats to digital formats is, is well done, but the transition to billions of screens being used to consume media, the transition from serial watching over time to binge digestion of content, from prime time to on demand, global experiences, and movement from individual produced pieces of content to integrated experiences is, a, is a, a change that I think alters fundamentally the way that uh, that media is being produced, the way that media is being consumed, and the technologies that are required to meet the challenges and opportunities present in the media space. There's this bizarre conflation of every one of the different channels for creativity influencing now every other different channel for creativity. I have toys that became movies, which became comics, which became books, which created sports stars, which then turned into more movies and more games. Every one of these different channels for creativity is now interconnected, not only by the experimentation of the producers themselves, but by the technologies that bind them all together. That kind of accretive value that opportunity to create a new kind of media presents an enormous number of challenges. First, every one of the systems in this space is growing at an incredible rate. I know a little more about the internet side of the house. I work at Google. Uh, and internet video is growing uh, at 53% here in the last year. We think it's going to be 70% of internet traffic by 2018. Internet video being shown on TV, so the reverse crossover, the big screen in your house now showing the little cat videos from YouTube, that's a 5x growth by 2018. We think mobile video as the new target delivery platform of choice is growing at an even faster rate, something like 14x. These kinds of transitions drive not just changes to the creative, but changes to the business of media manufacture. And there are huge challenges to that business, right? You have very specific, ever-shortening, hard release dates that are coordinated with the launch not only of, say, a feature film or a show, but it's coordinated applications and social messages and media plan and media buy. All of those interconnected systems depend on clear planning, clear communication, and great execution on timing. You have an incredible diversity in the tool chain that's being used. How many different pieces of software exist to render and transcode and composite and manipulate video, let alone the interconnection of that data to applications, let alone the interconnection of all of that data back to artists and the creatives that are building the next sets of tools. All of that generates, like, like Eric has said, an incredible explosion in data. Exabytes is not an absurd term. Uh, we're looking at you know 4K video easily producing 16 gigabytes a second in net new material, and that's just for a single layer. We're also seeing the, each of these issues driving an incredible variety in uh, workload utilization. So I think it's really normal to have data center systems that you want to use as aggressively as possible, but when opportunities come and go in days and hours, you need to be able to operate in a very flexible way. I know some things about flexible working. I, I worked at a startup for a while, and, and I've noticed something as I've gone to work with media companies. There's not a lot of a difference. If I walk through the sequence of steps, I gotta build a concept, get funding, put together our sort of logical narrative plan, put together a production team, get the talent in, build our content, and then figure out how to bring that content to market. That same team looks like a startup. It looks like the kinds of creative people that are building the new digital economy right next to the new media economy. So maybe there's some crossover there. You know, I've seen lots of computer geeks in movies. Most of the time they're hacking into alien motherships and things like that. 
Uh, but, but I think there's going to be a lot more geeks behind the movies than there are in the movies for quite some time. So maybe there are a couple ideas from Silicon Valley that can translate over into Tinseltown. So uh, the first of those, I'm a big Newton fan, uh, like standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, many, many, many businesses are finding the advantage of operating from the perspective of the development of platforms rather than the development of an individual product. Right? You could have made just The Hobbit, but instead you make two trilogies of money. Right? It, you could have built just a way for people to download movies, but instead you build Netflix, a system for everybody to produce new movies, to deliver new movies, to stream them, to get them sent by mail. Those platforms enable an incredible cultivation of creativity, and they allow the innovators that build them to reap the benefit of all of the creative teams across this industry working together as opposed to apart. Another important idea uh, I'm a big fan of is data-driven decision-making. We have more information about the performance of media than we have ever had, and we will get more of that kind of information than than we have ever had in the next year and the year after that. The tools to evaluate that data have gotten incredibly better than just two years ago or four years ago. And our ability to rapidly make choices about exactly what we ought to do, examples like you know picking which movie is most likely to be something that somebody else wants to see, or helping decide on which kinds of movies to fund, each of these different kinds of operations are powered by data. And the quicker our media producers are able to digest the value of information, the quicker they can deliver great content to us. I'm also a huge fan of the concept of the minimum viable product uh, or agile development, this concept of you build a tiny, incredible thing as quickly as possible and test it. I think Saturday Night Live is an amazing example of this stuff. How many shorts have become movies? And probably almost more importantly, how many shorts have not become movies that were total disasters, right? There are, there are bad shorts all the time on SNL. That's part of their experimentation, right? Or, or imagine the very first South Park video. I don't think anybody thought that that was going to be as big as it was, but they tested it by putting it out on the internet and seeing what the market would bear. And everybody thought that was interesting, right? How many current movie and music stars come from Nickelodeon? or from Disney, right? These interconnections between experimentative, small-scale, early evaluations of environments uh, leading to big successes based on, again, those data-driven analyses. There's also a strange trend uh, that's present in Sil Silicon Valley called the full-stack developer. This is the idea that you, you, what you really need is someone who can just do absolutely everything so that you can apply them to whatever part of the problem space is currently in challenge. And the reality of this is, uh, is twofold. One, you tend to very uh, aggressively reduce the scope of the stack in order to be able to have people actually be able to do all of the things you're trying to do. So rather than someone who can build the machine shop for assembling individual hard drives all the way over here to the most amazing artist in the history of the world, you narrow that down a little bit. So that's driven, as well as several of these other ideas, a bigger idea, this concept of delivery of almost anything at this point as a service. I can get cars to my house as a service and flowers to my wife as a service, and I can get giant data centers as a service. Right? Like, how much can't be delivered in this method? So that really drives not only the, uh, the, the startup-oriented behaviors that I described, the kinds of things that have made Silicon Valley successful, it also meets the business drivers that have made enterprises across myriad verticals extract value from all sorts of services delivered, again, as a service. So that, that drives to my core suggestion, right, that your next project probably fits in a cloud platform. Let's talk about what the mechanics of that are and what the benefits of that are. So for the last 16 years, Google's build, been building the world's fastest, most powerful, highest quality cloud infrastructure on the planet. I can say that without qualification. There are no competitors to that. We have built the most massive facilities there are. We are the world's largest internet service provider. We are a substantial producer of the servers that are built on the planet. We are a substantial consumer of the x86 processors worldwide. And the, the building we're currently talking about in is powered by this cloud. YouTube, the world's largest digital media management service, runs on the platform I'm describing. 
right? So it is very clear. You can build things that scale and you can deliver incredible experiences powered by this technology. And it's this expertise and depth, hundreds of PhD data center engineers, folks working on airflow dynamics in and out of the buildings, folks working on the specific twist radius of individual cables, that kind of focus on excellence, which reminds me a lot of the focus of, on excellence that I see when I go to a movie set, when I go to a 3D lab, when I go to a VFX shot, is built only and specifically around the core goals of Google being able to make uh, all of the world's information accessible. So that's driven this incredible change in pricing very different to purchase from a service provider than it is to purchase from a facilities manufacturer. If you build a building, you need to hold the capital costs associated with that. We, we, we don't work that way. So Google's cloud platform is built where you pay per minute for the infrastructure that you use, not per hour, not per year, per minute. And we charge the same amount for a thousand computers for an hour as we do for an hour of a thousand computers. Now, the cost to you to build a data center with a 1,000 machines in it is a lot higher. But for us, it's just the same turn on the graph. And if you do use a machine for a long period of time, you have a, a steady state running workload, we have automatic discounts that kick in that require no commitments. And what we think that this pricing together with that technology advantage drives is this unbelievable opportunity to make a huge change in the industry. I think everybody underestimates how big of a shift we will see in the next five years around these technologies. So I'll, I'll give some examples, right? Google has been building software that powers this infrastructure for a decade. Uh, the container technology that's being used today uh, is, a, is a direct product of innovations 11 years ago in Google data centers. Things like the Google file system, which in, in, informs the design of Hadoop, uh, Dremel, which informs the design of HBase. These different systems are all built around Google innovations that have allowed us to operate at this scale today. We're not just building the infrastructure for all of you to use, we did in fact build it for us, and it does a lot of really interesting things. So uh, I think it's, I, I thought it was a useful way to show, there are some interesting tie-ins to the uh, Academy Award winners for each year, like um, you know, I think Spanner as a, a scale-out multi-data center uh, high availability petabyte SQL database is the kind of thing that can in fact take you out of the Hurt Locker or uh, Dataflow makes it a lot easier to build movies uh, because you can coordinate the distribution rather than having to fly back and forth to terrorist countries. So uh, back to the challenges, right? The specific things that are hard about this workload. The places where building, building a movie, building a new creative media asset have present incredible challenges. Each of them have their own kinds of unique requirements. We work together with shops that are doing rendering where the, the scale of your compute is a huge driver of opportunity, where your ability to tolerate enormously complex models operating on very, very high core density machines uh, creates big constraints in the kind of data centers that you use. Every time you're able to get faster machines, you can earn more money. But buying new machines means buying new machines. And there are complexities associated with that. So same kind of workload, simulation, evaluating what you're about to go render, requires an entirely different kind of data center. You would literally buy different equipment in order to optimize around that workload. Same with compositing, right? If you're able to build a data center designed around the super high I.O., the disk access workload of compositing, you've literally built the wrong one to go do rendering. And if you're using the same machines to do both, you're probably impacting the performance of one workload by superimposing another. And most people operate inside of this very fixed, not only physical space time, but also a very fixed wall clock time. There's only so many hours between each iteration of a piece of work that you're working on that you, can, uh, th that you have to tolerate in these workflows. For example, like we're working on uh, processing super high resolution, you know, hero frames, the kinds of, you know, giant spaceships and war epics, or when you have to fix somebody's face as a result of a bad shot. Those kinds of frames can take hours and hours to render. And if you stack up those rendering events 
inside of a real like real world workflow where you have to ask your boss for approval and you have to talk to the committee to make sure they like it. Each of those steps, any time they take longer, it costs money. And so we're able to build data center environments where you can deliver these kinds of renders and transcodes and, and compositing effects and simulation effects and all the rest of the different workflows in a way where you aren't constrained by capacity. So we're doing this today. This isn't a future vision talk. This is a current state of the world. We are in fact doing rendering and simulation and transcoding and video streaming at an incredible scale and data analysis and archival on our data centers. This is stuff that we are doing today and we have unique differentiation in those areas. Maybe an easy example, a first place to start. Uh, we, we recently acquired a company called Zinc Render. Zinc uh, creates an easy environment for doing rendering in the cloud. You don't have to set up any of the data centers. You don't need any technicians to be able to evaluate which operating system patch works best with which version of this rendering engine software, none of that stuff. You send us your files, we render, we send you back the results. And this stuff isn't being used for kids' toys or little movies. Uh, three of the five films nominated for best virtual effects in 2014 were rendered using this platform. Not like one, like three, like the majority. The movies that we thought looked amazing came out of the cloud already. So it's amazing to me that there are still so many opportunities left to make this transition. We worked really closely with Framestore. Framestore uses Compute Engine, that's a product from Google's cloud platform, to provide this kind of rendering processing power. They're using 15,000 cores at peak on demand from us. No upfront commit, no planning ahead, no calling saying, is this cool, do you have enough? They just render. They saved $300,000 by eliminating the unused idle processing that was sitting in their existing data centers. That kind of transition from underutilized, expensive to manage, complicated to buy correctly, difficult to implement at scale, to on demand, as easy as calling for a pizza. So we've also worked really closely, not just with the rendering, recognize this, this tool is being used by an ecosystem of providers. It's available for building not just the movie part of these connected, integrated experiences, but for building the applications which power them, for building the interconnections between interfaces. We worked with StarMaker, they build an application that's tied into the voice. It allows people at home to play a little micro version of the voice. And they get rated, they get thumbs up and thumbs down, somebody buzzes them in. That application has operated without an operations staff. They built the whole application, they stood the whole thing up, they haven't had downtime in two years, they don't have anybody whose job title says ops. They just build it and hand it to Google, and we take care of it. That's the model for delivery of a platform as a service, as opposed to just bare infrastructure where you really are in charge of management of those systems. And they're, they're operating at high scale, it's four billion minutes of singing time that have been run through their processors. And there's numerous examples of this stuff. We're working with not only some of the biggest businesses as customers, but with some of the biggest technology providers as partners to ensure that the platform is not just something that you can come in and be the first mover on and earn all of the lumps as you try to figure out the right way to do it, but instead by following well-trod paths to exactly how you execute in a timely way, at low risk, at low cost, in a way that delivers great value and enables you to create amazing experiences. So I'm really interested in, in, in everybody's interest and feedback and uh, desire to evaluate this thing. We think that it's possible to build the future of media in the cloud, that the price advantages, the scale advantages, and the focus advantages create an opportunity for everyone in the media and entertainment industry to build something incredible, to build it in a way that they've never imagined before and build it to the effect of an incredible earning of revenue and earning of recognition for the performance of your work. That kind of focus on excellence is something, again, that I've seen inside at Google and I've seen outside at the media and entertainment companies that I've gone to visit. I really appreciate everybody taking the time. I'm looking forward to the rest of the presentations and have a great day at NAB. Yeah.
Sure. Yeah, I, I can speak to Kubernetes at length. So um, inside Google, there's a uh, an innovation that was made about 11 years ago uh, called the C group. It's a logical container that was built inside of the Linux kernel. We open sourced that code, returned it to the Linux kernel, uh, and Docker took that code out and created an interface format to it. Now, Google's been using this technology for the intermediary nine years. We boot some two billion containers a week. Every one of the infrastructure systems that I described, YouTube and all the rest, they all run on top of containers in production on Google today. That is how our technology stack works. So we are firm believers in the technology. The, there are three big advantages to the design around the use of containerized technology for infrastructure deployment. First, first piece is once you have a container cluster up and running, the amount of time that it takes to start a container is typically on the order of 30 to 50 milliseconds. Not seconds, not minutes, milliseconds. So at Google, inside of an event request, you go to www.google slash some interesting web page, enter, that hits the front of the load balancers, and then we boot the container that will answer the question. And then we turn it off by the time you're done clicking. Right? That's how fast they're able to operate. So especially in testing environments, you need to run an evaluation programmatically across a zillion different versions of a video to figure out which colors blend correctly or which rendering pipeline produces the same outputs as you expect. Each of those tasks you can run as fast as you can turn machine on and off. And you don't pay for the individual machine starts because they're running inside of a static cluster. That change for some customers that I've worked on, because of the way cloud systems, ours and everybody else's, are billed, you pay per virtual machine start, but you don't pay per container start. That's huge for, for a customer that I'm thinking of. That's $600,000 a month in transition costs. They went from 600 grand to about 40 bucks to run their testing environment. It's an unbelievable shift. Another component, super, super important, is the inheritance of consistency, this model of the immutable server, a model where you don't ever change, you don't ever log in, you don't ever manipulate the virtual machine, or in this case, the container. You use container registries to ensure and enforce that kind of consistency across a diverse application team. Now, the big advantage there has to do with, again, big teams. If you have 15 different departments all working on different parts of applications, you want them all to be able to reference a single consistent, a golden image is what it used to get called. Well, you can have golden images now which retain all of the uniqueness of this specific driver in this specific configuration setting literally running on exactly the same machine as something that's set up totally differently. Right? You can have a different version of Java and a different version of patches and a different version of the OS at, at, the, at the application tier. Those differences allow you to build applications which inherit successfully running systems rather than forcing you to rebuild every single thing with the newest stuff every time. Really reduces the operational overhead associated. The other important bit uh, that I think is equally critical is that they are flexible. The container system is designed to be able to move from infrastructure to infrastructure. So today you can install Kubernetes on, on premise on your own data centers, run exactly the same way Google does. When you're done with those containers on your environment, you run exactly the same command and they turn on on Google. That interoperability creates an opportunity for you to find the best infrastructure to run your workloads on per workload, per part of a workload. That kind of difference we're finding a lot of people find very attractive. Yeah, anytime. Go ahead.
yeah. if they weren't careful. But those um, legacy costs are costs of doing business that were never really factored in, and they are now. So, mm-hmm. I mean, is that how is how does that get addressed in your business now? And sure. So, I mean, today, uh, today we're offering uh, a system called durable reduced availability storage. So that op- operates at just over two cents a gigabyte for perpetual storage operated by the same backup and storage systems behind Drive, behind Gmail, behind YouTube. So that those systems don't lose files. There are many, many copies across diverse data centers in diverse physical locations. We're operating at 11 nines of durability matching with the sort of industry standard. And you can interoperate with that data store using industry standard object store metaphors, right? So same, same implementation, same code, same software works across these different major object store providers. We also know uh, that file systems as a model for the data storage metaphor behind most big applications, rendering, transcoding, compositing, all are expecting the POSIX file store semantics. So on Google Cloud Platform today, you have the fastest local solid state disk of any vendor. Uh, We deliver up over 600,000 IOPS to local SSD on single instances and you can build clusters of those instances. So we've worked with a couple of different technology providers. You can easily do as small as single machine using ZFS on Linux. You can have larger clusters using Red Hat cluster clusters where you're talking about dozens of machines that are involved that can leverage the local SSD as well as our very high performance solid state disk backed persistent disk, that's an extra terabyte. And then you can have behind that magnetic media and other extra terabytes and all of that can be a front for the unlimited petabytes of GCS storage. Further than that, we're also working with a large number of the technology providers in the caching and disk storage optimization space. So you'll see more and more announcements from us around those partnerships to make it even easier for media workflows to interoperate with our cloud. Excellent. What else? Anything? Open season? Fuzzy guy up front? Ready to go? Awesome. Yeah, there. Google is. Yeah, I know Todd. Yeah, so Todd's the founder of Zinc Render, right? Um, so uh, Todd, Todd, Todd is a buddy of Canberra's and I's. It's uh, Google has always been a little shy on human. We're a little low on people. So uh, we we try to be as efficient as we can. We try to move as quickly as we can. Um, but I, but I appreciate your positive praise. The, uh, the folks that I'm working with are really excited about diving in with studios, helping them unpack the value proposition, helping them understand what it is we're able to do, and, and frankly, just helping them get to actually kicking the tires. Once your foot makes contact with the cloud tire, everything gets very different. People say, "Oh, I can do things I didn't think I could do," and they tear off into building pretty amazing stuff. So, thanks. Anything else? We have a big yeah. chat on our website. Mm-hmm. Would you be willing to send that to the Sure. Thank you. Yeah, happy to help.